morning. And to our Australian friends, good day. I am Carl Weisenbach, the director of the Eisenhower Presidential Library Museum and Boy at Home. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this great institution here in Abilene, Kansas. Our deputy director, Tim Rees, has done considerable research on what General Eisenhower said when he, he made the decision to go on D-Day. Tim will share the results of his research with you. Following Tim's presentation, we will have some time for some questions. Please raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. Please keep in, please remember that this program is being filmed, so wait for the microphone before asking your question. And now please welcome my colleague, Tim Rees. Thank you, Carl. Well, I want to talk with you this morning about an elusive D-Day mystery that persists despite the millions of words written about the Allied invasion of Normandy on June 6th, 1944. What did General Dwight D. Eisenhower say when he gave the final order to launch the attack? It's puzzling, to me anyway, that you know, perhaps the most important of decision of the 20th century did not bequeath to history, to posterity, a memorable quote to mark the occasion, something to live up you know, to the magnitude of, of Ike's decision, something iconic like General Douglas MacArthur's vow to the people of the Philippines, I shall return. The stakes of the invasion certainly merited verbal splendor, if not grandiloquence. If the overlord operation had failed, the Allies might never have won the war. And yet eyewitnesses to Eisenhower's great moment of decision could not agree on what he said. And as for Eisenhower, he could not even agree with himself. He related five versions of his fateful words to journalists and biographers over the years. Uh, perhaps even more mysteriously, he wrote five different versions of the statement in a 1964 article commemorating the 20th anniversary of D-Day. Well, to put those words, whatever they might have been, into context, the high drama of those meetings leading up to the invasion decision certainly bear repeating. All the elements for the D-Day attack were in place by the spring of 1944. More than 150,000 men, nearly 12,000 aircraft, almost 7,000 sea vessels. It was arguably the largest amphibious invasion force in history. Every possible contingency had been planned for, every piece of equipment issued, every bit of terrain studied. The invasion force was like a coiled spring, Ike said, ready to strike Hitler's European fortress and all it waited for was his command as Supreme Commander Allied Expeditionary Force to go. But for all the preparation, there were critical elements that Eisenhower couldn't con control, namely the tides, the moon, and the weather. And the ideal low tidal and lunar, bright lunar conditions required for the invasion prevailed only a, a few days each month. And as we saw a few moments ago, those of us who watched I -Day, or Eisenhower's uh, documentary on D-Day, the dates for June were the 5th, the 6th, and the 7th. And if the attack were not launched on those dates, um, they would be forced to wait until June 19th to try again. Any wait increased risking the secrecy of the operation. Any wait would also cut into the summertime weather that the Allies would have to campaign. The inescapable consequences of postponement, Ike would later write in his 1948 memoir, Crusade in Europe, were almost too bitter to contemplate. Ike and his staff began meeting in early June to choose the final invasion date, a date now contingent on the best weather forecast. The setting was Southwick House near Portsmouth in southern England. The conference room where they met was large, a 25 by 50 foot former library with floor to ceiling French doors, dark oak paneling, and a blue rug which Ike would pace anxiously in the days leading up to the invasion. Empty bookshelves lined the room, a forlorn reminder of its now decidedly unliterary purpose. Ike, his commanders, and his weather team, led by Group Captain J.M. Stagg, met in the library twice a day at 4 a.m. and 9.30 p.m. On the evening of Saturday, June 3rd, Stagg reported that the good weather England experienced in May had moved out and a low was coming in. He predicted June 5th would be cloudy, stormy, windy, and with a cloud base of zero to 500 feet. That is, it would be too windy to disembark troops in landing craft and too cloudy for the all-important 
preparatory bombardment of the German coastal defenses. The group reconvened early the next morning to give the weather a second look. Stagg's forecast was no better, and Eisenhower reluctantly postponed the invasion for another day. The group gathered again at 9.30 the evening of Sunday, June 4th. Ike opened the meeting and signaled for Stagg to begin. Standing, Stagg reported a coming break in the weather, predicting that after a few more hours of rain would come 36 hours of clearer skies and lighter winds to make a June 6th invasion possible but he made no guarantees. The commanders debated the implications of the forecast, and they were still struggling towards consensus when Eisenhower spoke up. The question, Ike said, is just how long can you keep this operation on the end of a limb and let it hang there? The order, he said, must be given. Slower ships receive provisional orders to sail, but Ike would wait until the next morning to make the decision final, and he ordered the men to return in the early hours of June 5th. Ike rose at 3.30 and traveled the muddy mile from his camp to Suffolk House through withering rain and wind. Stagg had been right. If the invasion had began that morning on June 5th, it would have failed. Ike started the meeting. Stagg repeated his forecast. The break in the weather should hold. His brow was furled as a Kansas cornfield. Eisenhower turned to each of his principal subordinates for their final say on launching the invasion the next day, Tuesday, June 6th. 1944. General Bernard Law Montgomery, who would lead the assault forces, said go. Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey, the naval commander-in-chief, said go. Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Lee Mallory, the air commander-in-chief, said go. Eisenhower stood up and began walking the war room's blue rug back and forth, pondering the most important decision of his life and the fate of millions of people. It was now up to him. Only he could make the decision. He kept pacing, hands clasped behind his back, chin on his chest, and then he stopped. The tension left his face. He looked up at his commanders and said, what? <laughs> well, this is where history draws a blank. What did Ike say when he launched the D-Day invasion, and why is there no single memorable quote? Well, the eyewitnesses offer answers, but little help. <laughs> Of the 11 to 14 men who attended the final decision meeting, and that number, as we'll see, is in dispute, only four men besides Eisenhower reported what they, were believed, what they believed were the Supreme Commander's historic words. And the accounts of three of these men appeared in their memoirs published between 1947 and 1969. Lieutenant General Walter Bedell Smith, who was Ike's chief of staff, probably spent as much time with him as anyone during the war, reported, well, we'll go. In his memoir, Eisenhower's Six Great Decisions, which came out in 1956, Major General Francis de Guigand, who was General Montgomery's chief of staff, reported, we will sell tomorrow in Operation Victory, published in 1947. And in Intelligence at the Top, which came out in 1969, Major General Kenneth Strong, whom Ike has described as the best intelligence officer he ever worked with, said, OK, boys, we will go. Admiral Ramsey died in an airplane crash during the war and left no memoir, but his version survives through the reporting of Alan Mitchie of Reader's Digest magazine. Mitchie published the story behind the Ramsey quote in his 1964 war book, The Invasion of Europe, and it's the best account available to historians of a contemporary journalist who tried to verify what Ike said near the date of the invasion. Mitchie writes how he began his quest for the elusive phrase on June 5th, pressing Admiral Ramsey for the moment-by-moment -moment details of that final meeting at Suffolk House. And Ramsey was fluently unrolling his story until he reached the moment of Ike's decision. There he stalled. Well, what did Eisenhower say? What words did he actually use, Mitchie asked. I can't quite remember, Ramsey said, but it was, quote, a short phrase, and something typically American. Mitchie peppered Ramsey with possibilities all of which the admiral dismissed until the correspondent hit upon, OK, let her rip. <laughs> Ramsey tentatively confirmed it, but warned Mitchie he would need Eisenhower's agreement. Mitchie rushed to Ike's command trailer and asked an aide for Eisenhower's imprimatur. The aide returned a few minutes later and told Mitchie that if he and Ramsey agreed on the phrase, it was good enough for Ike. A military censor forced Mitchie to get the quote reconfirmed a few days later when he attempted to cable his story to Reader's Digest. Once again, Eisenhower obliged, and OK, Letter Rip appeared in the magazine's August 1944 issue. Well, Mitchie's account of the meetings 
leading up to the decision impressed Eisenhower's British military assistant, Colonel James Galt, who noted Mitchie's article in his diary. Galt lent his diary to Kenneth S. Davis, an early Eisenhower biographer, when he arrived at Ike's headquarters in August 1944. Notes from the diary found in Davis's personal papers, which are over at Kansas State University, confirm that Davis was aware of Mitchie's version of the quote, but he published his own phrase in his 1945 book, Soldier of Democracy. All right, Davis reports, we move. Davis presumably got this from Eisenhower in one of his three interviews with the general that August, but his papers do not contain verbatim notes of his interviews with Ike. The Davis Book Project was backed by Milton Eisenhower, um, Ike's youngest brother, the president of Kansas State College at that time, now of course, Kansas State University. Milton encouraged Davis to write the biography, quote, so that at least one good one is produced, unquote. Competing books by Alden Hatch and Francis Trevelyan Miller were already in the works by 1943. Hatch will do an interesting, incredible job, Milton told his brother, but it will not be very deep. While he feared Miller's book would read, quote, like the Encyclopedia Britannica, as in factual but dry. Hatch did not meet Ike until June 1945, but he nevertheless published his own version of the D-Day quote in the fall of 1944. Gentlemen, we will go ahead as planned. Miller's account stopped on the eve of the evasion and omits Ike's final words. This first of Eisenhower biographies appeared on bookshelves four days after we landed on Normandy, so they were pretty quick. Unlike the efforts of Hatch and Miller, Milton assured Ike that the Davis book promised to be one of real value in the war effort on the home front and to have real historical information. Although Ike would have qualms with soldier of democracy, for example, he thought Davis overemphasized class conflict here in Ike's Abilene, Kansas hometown, he approved his secretary's recommendation of the work to a man who, again quoting, wanted to know what your thoughts were at 4 a.m. on that day when you had to make the great decision. Additionally, while Eisenhower made 250 annotations in his copy of the Davis biography, he does not comment on Davis's version of his D-Day words. Another wartime writer, Chester Wilmot of the BBC, reports, OK, we'll go, in the struggle for Europe, which came out in 1952. Wilmot interviewed Eisenhower twice, on August 11, 1944, and again on October 16, 1945. And he submitted his questions to the general before the 1945 interview, which we have in the archives here at the library. Question three asked specifically for the details of the June 5th meeting, and perhaps he got them, but like Kenneth Davis, Wilmot's interview notes, which are at the National Library of Australia, contain no direct evidence of his quote. Nevertheless, Wilmot's version was confirmed by Eisenhower in the CBS documentary, D-Day Plus 20 Years, which we watched just a few moments ago. It was an anniversary special uh, filmed in England and France in July and August of 1963. It then aired on June 6th, 1964, which was a Saturday night 50 years ago. Walter Cronkite interviewed Ike in the same Suffolk room where he made the great decision. And in this interview, Ike said, quote, I thought it, meaning the likely weather, was just the best of a bad bargain. So I said, OK, we'll go. Eisenhower had the chance to amend his words when he reviewed galley proofs of the interview transcripts prepared for publication in the New York Herald Tribune by the historian Martin Blumenson. Ike made almost 80 revisions to the text, but did not touch the D-Day quote. The case for OK, We'll Go appears to be strengthened by its use by the late John S.D. Eisenhower and David Eisenhower, Ike's son and grandson, in their respective works, Allies by John, which came out in 1982, and Eisenhower at War, in, which came out in 1986. But then what are we to make of John's earlier use of the quote, I guess we'd better go, which appears in Letters to Mamie, 1978. A similar version of the Wilmot Cronkite quote is Stephen Ambrose's OK, Let's Go, which appears in his many popular World War II books. In The Supreme Commander, which came out in 1970, Ambrose claimed he garnered it from Eisenhower during an October 27, 1967 interview. Quote, he was sure that was what he said, unquote. But Ike's post-presidential records uh, cast doubt on Ambrose's claim. He did not see the young historian that day. Ike was playing golf in Augusta, Georgia cursing his slice, not revisiting the past. Furthermore, in Ambrose's book, D-Day, June 6, 1944, The Climactic Battle of World War II, 
he mistakenly attributes the quote to the 1963 Walter Cronkite interview, which in any case we know Ike said, okay, we'll go, not okay, let's go. The confusion over Ike's D-Day words would spread beyond the English-speaking world. Claus Jacoby of the German magazine Der Spiegel interviewed Eisenhower at his Palm Desert, California vacation home on May 6th, 1964. His version approximates the Wilmot Cronkite quote, adding one word, okay, we'll go ahead. Eisenhower reviewed Jacoby's article before publication, but as usual, did not comment on the D-Day quote, although he did strike out the statement that the Allies would have dropped atomic weapons on Germany had the D-Day invasion failed. Eisenhower's last documented encounter with an author's version of his D-Day words is found in a manuscript written by his friend, Colonel Red Reader. Reader records, well, we'll go. I rely on the courage of your men. In Dwight David Eisenhower, Fighter for Peace, which came out in 1968, it's actually a children's book. Ike reviewed Reader's draft in July 1967. He made almost 180 comments on the manuscript, but he did not question the D-Day quote. In fact, I have found no evidence in any of our records that Ike ever once commented on or corrected the different quotes he found in the work of journalists, biographers, or former comrades. But neither did he use them in his own most detailed account of the June 5th meeting, nor for that matter did he use his own most recent statement, okay, we'll go. Instead, Eisenhower wrote five different versions of the quote in drafts of a 1964 article for the Paris Match magazine. Paris is in France, not Texas. The article was about D-Day, but it had a contemporary strategic purpose as well. France was becoming more and more independent of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO at that time, and reminding the French of their shared sacrifice during the Second World War might strengthen their bond with the Allies. As Jean Monnet, a leading advocate for European unity, said to Ike in a telegram at that time, quote, I feel sure that an article by you at this moment on the landing would be politically most important, unquote. Well, given this importance, Ike presumably put a lot of thought into the story, which either makes the various versions it contains more perplexing, or it may explain them. Eisenhower may have been searching you know, for just the right words uh, for his French readers. In his notes for the article, Ike wrote, yes, we will attack on the 6th. In the first full draft of the story, he writes, yes, gentlemen, we will attack on the 6th. In the next draft, he scratches this out and he writes, gentlemen, we will attack tomorrow. Elsewhere in the draft, referring back to his decision, he said, we will make the attack on June 6th, which he then struck out and wrote, we will attack tomorrow. In the final draft, he makes two references to his decision, we will attack tomorrow, and gentlemen, we will attack tomorrow, thereby demonstrating once again his apparent lack of concern with exactly what he said in the early morning hours of June 5th, 1944. The Paris Match article appeared within days of the New York Herald Tribune series, the CBS airing of D-Day plus 20 years, and the Der Spiegel article to put three different Eisenhower quotes in three languages before the international public at the same time. The quote was lost before there was even a chance for it to be lost in translation. Well, what accounts for all these accounts of Ike's D-Day words, his own and those of the eyewitnesses and, and others? Well, the historian David Howarth perhaps captured it best in his description of the June 5th meeting. Howard writes, nobody was there as an observer. However high a rank a man achieves, his capacity for thought and feeling is only human. And one may imagine that the capacity of each of these men was taxed to the limit by the decision they had to make so that none of them had the leisure or inclination to detach his mind from the problem and observe exactly what happened and remember it for the sake of historians. The stress confounding the commanders obscured other key details of the meeting. What time did they meet? Who was there? Was Ike sitting or pacing when he made the decision? And how long did it take him to make up his mind? Various eyewitnesses placed the June 5th meeting at 4, 4.15, and 4.30 a.m. Eisenhower was nearly as inconsistent with the time as he was with his words. In the early Paris match drafts, he states that he made the final decision at 4. But in the last draft, he says the meeting started at 4.15. In his 1948 war memoir, he records he made the decision at 4.15. General Montgomery puts the decision at 4 o'clock in his 1946 account of the meeting, 
but at 4.15 in his memoir 12 years later. Another six eyewitnesses who note the time of the meeting cast one vote for four, four for 4.15, and one for 4.30. Francis de Guigan omits the June 5th date altogether and places the final decision on the night of June 4th, as do a couple of other witnesses. The identity of these eyewitnesses is questioned by the eyewitnesses. A June 5th, 1944 memo by operations planner Major General Harold Bull names Eisenhower, Montgomery, Ramsey, Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, Lee Mallory, Air Vice Marshal James Robb, Rear Admiral George Crazy, and Generals Smith, Strong, and DeGuigan as present. Air Vice Marshal Robb had his own list, which adds General Sir Humphrey Gale, who is Ike's administrative officer, and the officer with my favorite name, Air Vice Marshal H.E.P. Wigglesworth. In some accounts, Group Captain Stagg attended the meeting, but left before the decision was made. Eisenhower is alone in including General Omar Bradley in his account of the final meeting, but Bradley states in his 1951 war memoir that he was aboard the USS Augusta at the time of Ike's decision. The eyewitnesses, a designation rapidly losing its force by now, further disagree on Ike's movements during the final decision meeting. Eisenhower paced the room in the account I shared earlier, which I got from General Strong, but General Walter Bedell Smith asserts that Ike sat. But was it on a sofa, as Smith writes, or at a conference table, as General de Guigan says, or in an easy chair, as the weatherman Stagg remembers? And how long did it take Eisenhower to make up his mind once his commanders had expressed their opinions? Was it the 30 to 45 seconds he recalled in the Walter Cronkite interview, or was it, quote, a full five minutes as General Smith recorded in his 1956 memoir. Well, Ike pondered these discrepancies in later years, and while he did not directly invoke David Howarth's fog of war explanation in his unpublished 1967 essay, Writing a Memoir, he agreed with its implications. Ike wrote, when accuracy is all important, memory is an untrustworthy crutch on which to lean. Witnesses of an accident often give under oath contradictory testimony concerning its details only hours later. How then can we expect two or more individuals, participants in the same dramatic occurrences of years past, to give identical accounts of the event? Ike, of course, is saying you can. not But there is more, I believe, to the mystery of Ike's D-Day words than the inability of memory to preserve the past. Eisenhower's humble character contributes to the riddle, and while his character alone cannot solve the mystery, it may explain why there is no single memorable quote associated with his great D-Day decision. Eisenhower famously disdained pomposity in word and manner. He disliked what he called the slick talker and the desk pounder. The histrionic gesture or declamation just wasn't in his personality, wasn't in his makeup. As his biographer, uh, the aforementioned Kenneth S. Davis writes, quote, there was nothing dramatic in the, may, in the way he made the final invasion decision. He didn't think in terms of history or destiny, nor did there arise in him any of that grandiose self-consciousness which characterizes the decisive moments of a Hitler or a Napoleon. Everything about Eisenhower was restrained, the great D-Day historian Cornelius Ryan adds, again quoting, apart from the four stars of his rank, a single ribbon of decorations above his breast pocket, and the flaming sword's shoulder patch of chafe, Eisenhower shunned all distinguishing marks. Even in the command trailer, there was little evidence of his authority. No flags, maps, framed directives, or signed photographs of the great or near great who often visited him. There is no memorable quote, in other words, because of Ike's good old-fashioned Kansas modesty. He did not have the kind of ego that spawns lofty sentiments for the press or posterity. Ike was a plain speaker from the plains of America's heartland. Contrast this with his former boss, General Douglas MacArthur, whose I Shall Return was carefully crafted for press and posterity. The US Office of War Information preferred we shall return, but lost the fight to the lofty MacArthur. Eisenhower's self-effacing character is also revealed in his other D-Day words, words he never intended anyone to hear. The words show he was far more concerned with taking responsibility for failure than with glorying in whatever success crowned D-Day. During that somber lull between the decision and the invasion, Ike scribbled a quick note and stuffed it in his wallet, as was his custom before every major operation. 
He misdated it July 5th, providing, I think, more evidence of the stress vexing him and his subordinates. He found the note a month later and showed it to an aide who convinced him to save it. We have it in the library. It's probably our single most important document. The note said simply, our landings in the Cherbourg Harb area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold, and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was best upon the best, based upon the best information available. The troops, the air, and the Navy did all the bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. Eisenhower's D-Day worries lay with the consequences of that great decision, not the style or lack thereof in which it was uttered. And while the result of his D-Day decision is well known, his not so famous last words will remain a mystery, probably just the way he would have wanted it. Thank you. And we do have a few minutes for questions or comments, so we just ask that you come and, and use the microphone, please, since they are doing some filming today. But if not, that's okay, too. And we would welcome you all back for our next session, which begins at 1.30 this afternoon. So thank you all very much. <laughs>